This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We have got a lot of really fun football players left across the divisional round in the NFL, and that means a lot of fun player prop potential as well, despite there being just four games. We're going to break down player props across the divisional round for today by talking to J.J. Zacharies and picking his brain on where he sees value at FanDuel Sportsbook. Then later on, we're going to wrap up EPL Match Week 21 by talking to Austin Cass. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Saunas. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here to kick things off, as mentioned by JJ Zacharies, and check him out on Twitter at LateRoundQB. Find his work at LateRound.com and the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast, JJ Divisional Round, coming up this weekend. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, one in three last week, though, on this show in particular. It was one of those weeks, though, where I feel like sort of the situations to monitor stuff that we talked about kind of hit pretty well. And then the bets themselves. I really wish that I went with Njoku with his yardage and receptions props as opposed to just going anytime touchdown with him because the matchup was there and he crushed it. Uh, but yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to, to rebound this week. I'm thinking back on it, and I think it was the Njoku one, but there was another one where you had like a good read on the usage of a player, but the prop didn't hit. Or... Was, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't remember the, the the prop itself, but we talked up Aaron Jones a lot, and he yeah. did what he did. So that was yeah, cool. and Khalil Shakir as well had the touchdown. Yes. Yes. Um, the like reception numbers weren't there for Shakir, but like, yeah. I mean, he He's was good. Amazing. Like, you know, you score a touchdown like that, you got to get your flowers as well. But like, yeah. if Njoku goes for 88 yards or whatever, and Harrison Bryant is the guy who scores a touchdown. Like the wrong Miami tight end scored because Brevin Jordan had a yep. uh, a touchdown as well, or former the U uh, tight end. So you know it's just uh, the way things break for sure. But hey, yep. with the way things have gone overall this year, that means we're due for some positive regression this weekend. We'll dive in and outline where JJ sees value across this week here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts. Our full division round preview going game by game is up featuring Dr. Ed Feng. You can find that right here on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. Also over on FanDuel TV Plus and the FanDuel YouTube page. Make sure you're subscribed to get these as they go live each and every weekday. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or a thumbs up over on the FanDuel YouTube page. Now, JJ, not every team was in action this past week in the wild card round. So we can't dig into the data for every team and try to see, okay, what were the changes we saw during that round? But other teams that were in action, were there any big shifts you noticed that you think are relevant for this week when it comes to trying to predict props? Yeah, I think there's two two sort of situations uh, in the way they ran their offenses. So I'm going to go back to Buffalo where we had talked about no Gabe Davis and how that would affect sort of their personnel. Uh, maybe they'd run a little bit more 12 personnel uh, with, with Dawson Knox now healthy. They didn't really do that. Uh, they ran to a 12 personnel uh, at just a 7.6% rate against Pittsburgh uh, across the season. That number was 17.6%. So a pretty, uh, they actually ran fewer uh, 12 personnel packages against Pittsburgh. Khalil Shakir, ran as the starter. Uh, He had the second most routes for Buffalo. Now we have Gabe Davis again. He missed practice uh, once again yesterday. doesn't seem good for Gabe Davis. Um, So I would expect sort of a a similar uh, look for this Buffalo offense. And that means that Khalil Shakir uh, once again uh, is going to, is going to probably play as the number two wide receiver. I think the more interesting piece though, Jim, and this goes back to another 12 personnel tidbit, but Green Bay last week, ran the most 12 personnel uh, on the week at 48%. Now, the Packers were third in the NFL this year in 12 personnel rate, so they ran a lot of two two tight end sets, um, but that was still 15 percentage points higher uh, where they ran at 48% than what their season-long average was. Now, I think a lot of that, or some of that at least, had to do with sort of uh, containing Micah Parsons, Dallas plays a lot of man defense and that's one their linebackers sort of... are like 200 pounds. So like, you might as well get some big bodies out there to, to right. shove them around a bit. Yeah, right. Right. Like it was a very clear and obvious smart offensive plan by a, a better coach team. Uh, mm-hmm. Matt LaFleur versus Dan Quinn, who didn't adjust during that game. And that, that's, that I think is why uh, they did what they did. But I do think that there's one thing to also factor in here is that 
we had both of the rookie tight ends healthy in this game. Luke Musgrave was back. Uh, Tucker Craft, obviously, second half of the season was used a lot more. And, and really, you know, in that game, he was used more as a receiver. They both had three targets in that game, but he was Tucker Craft was the one who ran far more routes. He had 16 routes to Luke Musgrave's six. Um, but I do think that that could play a role as well. But what that means, taking a step back, is that we know that Green Bay sort of rotates their wide receivers, similar to what we see in like Kansas City, where, uh, you know, these guys aren't running 90% plus uh, of the team's routes very frequently. Romeo Dobbs was kind of the the, the go-to number one last week, but Jaden Reed didn't play that much. He only ran around on 52% of Green Bay's dropbacks. Uh, Dontavian Wicks actually ran more, uh, two more routes than Jaden Reed did. Christian Watson ran eight routes out of 21 dropbacks. I mean, it just wasn't a very clean, clear-cut situation for these wide receivers. And I think that we might see that again this week uh, against San Francisco if they go with a similar look. I, I don't think they're going to run as much 12 personnel, to be to be clear mm -hmm. there, because uh, I think San Francisco is smarter than the way that Dallas plays. And they don't run as much man as Dallas does. But uh, they do run a lot of 12 personnel, this Green Bay offense. And I would just look at this and say there's going to be a lot of variance and variability with the Green Bay wide receiver props this week. I'm just not touching them. That, that's really what it comes down to. I'm not, I, I could see Jaden Reed go off. Right. I could see Watson catch a big pass, but I just don't want to touch that situation. And I think that makes total sense. You know, we always have the option as betters to just not bet it. And I think that's a good, a good call out here is potentially just avoid the headache. That is the green Bay pass catchers. It's a headache because they're all pretty good. Honestly. Yeah. Like right. I've never been high on Dobbs, but he made me look very stupid last week. So, um, it, it's a good thing for them. It's a bad thing for us. So I think avoiding it entirely is smart. I want to go back to the bills. Can I get one Trent Sherfield target? Like I, know. I had, I had over 12 and a half receiving yards and I'm watching the next gen stats route numbers during the game. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, nothing yet. Um, but he's out there a lot. Uh, he'd be running out wide stuff like that. He should eventually get one target. And maybe that gets me my over. Nope. Not a no. single target the entire game for our guy, Trent Sherfield. So I, I would like just one. But can I have one, one target for Trent Sherfield across the entire game? Now, those are the ones that we saw in action last week. But let's open things up, JJ, and talk about other situations you have your eye on entering the divisional round. Any other spots where you're keeping an eye on props, even if they're not posted as of yet at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, I don't think that we can, or I don't think we should downplay. This is going to sound crazy, Jim. I don't think we should downplay Dalvin Cook in this game. Uh <laughs> He, he got elevated from the uh, in, uh, to the 53-man roster. They cut Melvin Gordon. Mm -hmm. uh, my fear with Cook isn't so much how he's going to dig into like Gus Edwards' role. I think Gus Edwards has a pretty solidified role being more of the goal line guy, early down guy, not much of a receiving threat. But I do worry a little bit about Justice Hill and the way that he's used as a receiver in that offense. So if this game script, for whatever reason, I mean, I think we all expect Baltimore to have a positive game script in this game. But if for whatever reason, you know, we don't know for sure, uh, it goes south. Uh, I think Dalvin Cook might see more usage than people are giving him credit for. And then if we see an insanely positive game script, they might want to get him some reps too. Yeah. So just keep an eye on Dalvin Cook's usage. That's really what this comes down to because he's now uh, the number three guy, you know, within that offense. Uh, there's also his brother, James Cook, who's playing this weekend against Kansas City. Uh, he saw a 69% running back rush share and a 13% target share this past week. Uh, over the last four weeks, and this is, again, this goes back to what we talked about last week, Jim, where, where we see when teams' backs are up against the wall, they sometimes just lean on their best players and their best running backs because they're not saving them for anything. James Cook, over the last four weeks, which is are all must-win games, basically, for Buffalo, uh, he's really seen an uptick in running back, uh, running back usage. Uh, he's seen an 80%, 73%, 62%, and now 69% running back rush share. So all those numbers are above 62%. Uh, that was closer to 55% in four games prior. Um, and some of that, there's some overlap with like Joe Brady taking over and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I do think it's noteworthy that they did use James Cook a decent amount in that game, or at least it continued uh, the, the usage, the uptick in usage from, from what we saw down the stretch. And then I think an obvious one to go to here with a fluid situation is Mark Andrews. We don't know at the time of this recording if he's going to be back or not. I would assume that if he is back, he's not going to play a full complement of snaps. And this is a really, really good matchup for tight ends in particular. I mean, that's why I attacked David and Joku last week. So if Mark Andrews is out, I might um, try to immediately go to a book and get something favorable for Isaiah likely because he's had really good usage over the last month in that offense. And I would expect him to be able to exploit that matchup too. For sure. And I, 
I think that with Andrews, it's it's kind of what you said, where even if he does play, I don't think he'll be 100 percent. Now, you got a full mm-hmm. practice in on Wednesday, which is obviously a positive sign. But based on the initial timeline of that injury, it doesn't seem like he's going to be, you know, 100 percent with James Cook. Snap rates for him have been awesome ever since that Dallas game where he shredded. He's at um yeah, 73 percent snap rate the week after that, 54 percent, 61 percent, 62 percent, all way above where he was before yeah. that huge game. So they've reacted to yeah. what he did there and they've definitely leaned on him quite a bit. So I do think that the rushing plus receiving props of James Cook and Isaiah Pacheco in that game. Very, very interesting. Let's dig into some yardage bets. Where are you seeing value across this week uh, or FanDuel Sportsbook, JJ? You're going to be shocked that I like Patrick Mahomes uh, over in his rushing. Uh, he's at 27 and a half. It opened up even lower in a, in a lot of spots. Definitely shop this number. But, um, you know, I talked about Mahomes last week, last week being more of a rusher in the playoffs. He didn't score last week where I think you can just constantly just throw that dart uh, as an anytime touchdown bet as in the side. I think it's like plus 600 right now. Um, but he did hit 41 rushing yards last week on just two attempts. Uh, the Chiefs might be forced into more of a pass heavy script in this game. That's good for Mahomes because he's not getting designed runs. It's all scrambles right. for Mahomes. Um, and the Bills do have some injuries sort of in the, in the middle of their defense where they might be able to exploit that a little bit with Mahomes' legs. So I like the over for Mahomes here. I think you could probably bet it up to like 29 and a half um, and, and, and still feel okay about it. Uh, another one that I like is Rashad White's under. He's at 54 and a half rushing yards right now. Uh, it's 50, or that's on DraftKings, 53 and a half over on FanDuel. So you could shop this a little bit too if you want that extra yard. Uh, but Detroit has allowed just four running backs this year to get to this mark, which is pretty crazy. Uh, they have a very, very good rush defense. One of them also, one of those games was against the, uh, the Vikings in week 18 when Detroit technically wasn't really playing for that much. I know that they still played their starters, but uh, just for what it's worth, uh, the Lions are favorites in this game. Tampa Bay could end up being fairly pass heavy as a result. Um, White has actually hit this under in nine of 17 games this year. I know he's been better and the offensive line for Tampa Bay has been better during the second half of the season, but uh, he still has been under this mark in over half of his games. Um, And this is against one of the best rush defenses in football. I wouldn't bet uh, Rashad White totals uh, just because he's obviously their primary pass catcher. I think Chase Edmonds is a little bit banged up right now too, which could factor into that a little bit. So I do think that that uh, you should stay away from that. But I do like his under rushing prop at 54 and a half. Yeah, Uh, Chase Edmonds didn't practice on either Wednesday or Thursday. It's a toe injury. And like with Chris Godwin being out on Wednesday, he had been out in previous weeks due to his knee. You know, they would rest him. Chase Edmonds was a new injury, I believe, with that toe injury. And he'd been eating into Rashad White's workload a bit. So I think keeping tabs on that is wise. because They do still have practice today on Friday to try to see if he can get back out there. Uh, But. I think the overall matchup, the efficiency, the or lack of efficiency, I should say, uh, for Rashad White, both point towards an under. You were talking about Mahomes with his props, and both of these, I think, are pretty good discounts at FanDuel Sportsbook right now compared to other books. Uh, 26 and a half, the rushing yardage number, as you alluded to. His touchdown prop is uh, six to one, or at least it was last yeah. time I checked. And if you're looking elsewhere, you're not going to get better, better than plus 450. So... If you want to take Mahomes props, which you should, because I agree with the thesis here of uh, Mahomes uh, and buying that rushing production, he has no rushing touchdowns this entire year. That screams regression, baby, with the amount yeah. he's rushing, especially Let's in the playoffs. It. So yeah. I am fully on board with Mahomes and fully on board with the overall process. And again, the best price you'll get on both those is a FanDuel Sportsbook. Speaking of uh, some touchdown props there at Mahomes, uh, he's six to one. Any other value props for you as far as touchdowns go this week? Yeah, I don't really love the touchdown markets this week. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. Uh, I So I'm just throwing darts. That, that's sort of the, my, my approach whenever I'm not feeling great about, you know, some of the obvious, uh, you know, more go-to guys. Uh, the first one's Dalton Kincaid. I know that he scored last week, but he's at plus 260 right now, or at least the last time I checked. Uh, that's that's pretty strong number. That's a pretty strong number considering Kansas City has a lot of the fourth highest adjusted target share to tight ends this year. Uh, Kincaid last week, you know, I, he, he's, he doesn't see the same usage with Dawson Knox active, but he ran nine more routes than Knox last week, and that's on very few attempts. They didn't go like crazy heavy pass uh, in that game against Pittsburgh. Uh, he scored a touchdown last week, and that's why I'm kind of surprised that this number is not a little bit higher, but um, did score a touchdown last week, but he was second on the team in target share as well. So I think they're still using Dalton Kincaid, you know, in a relatively decent manner for, for a tight end as a receiver. So I like that number. Again, I'm just going to shout this out. Not a lot of detail to it, but Houston's been really bad against tight ends. 
I think Isaiah likely would be very interesting, especially if Mark Andrews doesn't go. You could obviously risk it if you wanted to uh, and just say, oh, I don't think Mark Andrews is going to play. I think he was at like plus 200, like two to one right now. Um, and then the last one, I'm just going to go with another tight end. This is really long, but I, Tucker Craft is at plus 500. And the reason why I think it's so intriguing is what I talked about earlier is that Yes, him and Luke Musgrave tied in targets this past week, and Luke Musgrave was the one who found the end zone. But that's exactly why I think both of those guys have very similar touchdown uh, odds right now, is because the books are seeing this and they're saying, uh, "Oh, look, you know, Luke Musgrave found the end zone, and he saw just as many targets as Tucker Craft, but Tucker Craft ran almost three times as many routes as Luke Musgrave did." And so, you know, I don't. I, the, the San Francisco as a matchup is not very great for tight ends, but this is a these are pretty pretty decent odds for a guy who's barely heavily involved as a receiver in this offense. And if they're going to run a lot of 12 personnel again, then Tucker Craft is going to be on the field. So it's a long shot. Matchup's not great, but the, the odds are there, I think, for him to, to bet this. And with Tucker Craft, too, I mean, with the Musgrave thing, it, it, he, he had a, a wide open broken coverage touchdown. So that's why mm -hmm. I think you're seeing identical numbers here, despite the fact that Craft did run a lot more routes. And the fact that Although Musgrave's route rate did go up from where it was in week 18, it didn't skyrocket. And that to me says we shouldn't expect him to suddenly re-become the tight end one as he gets further removed from that kidney injury. So I think that yeah. that does make a lot of sense to still be in on craft despite the fact we're one week further removed uh, for um, Musgrave post-kidney procedure. That's all we got for JJ for today. JJ, appreciate the time. As always, check out his work on Twitter at Late Round QB. Find his work at LateRound.com and the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. JJ, delight talking to you as always. Good luck to you this week, and we'll talk to you once again next Friday. Thanks, Jim. Alrighty, again, find JJ on Twitter at Late Round QB to dig into all of that as well. We're going to bring in Austin Cass here in a second to break down his thoughts on the second half of EPL Match Week 21. But first, when it comes to the NFL playoffs, you've got to win one game at a time. When you bet the playoffs on FanDuel, one game can mean a lot of wins. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, has all your favorite bets like the money line and spread, and there's all sorts of prop bets like the cornerback passing yards or who will score the first touchdown. Plus, every day there's an NFL playoff game. FanDuel is giving all customers a no sweat same game parlay that means when you combine all your bets for a chance at a bigger payday you'll get bonus bets back if your sgp does not win make every moment more with fanduel an official sportsbook partner of the nfl must be 21 plus and present in select states minimum three-leg parlay required refund issued as non withdrawable bonus bets which expire seven days after receipt max refund five dollars unless otherwise specified restrictions apply see terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Where's the FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, Virginia, and Vermont. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-789. 7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut 1809 with it in Indiana 1-800-522-4700 in Kansas and Wyoming or visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland and go to 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia Let's bring on now Austin Cass. He is a senior editor for us here at FanDuel Research. You can find Austin on Twitter at Austin Cass. And Austin, I am surprised you decided to show up today because you're tempting fate, I got to say. Uh, we had the first half, EPL Match Week 21 last week, and you went 3-0. and So why would you come back knowing that the regression monster is lurking and waiting to just chop you off at the ankles? Yeah, I am willing to roll the dice. Yeah, I think you're my good luck charm. My my bets when I come on here do a lot better than when I don't come on here. Uh, but the problem is I didn't have time to bet yours last week, though, the recommendations you gave. And so, like, I went back on Monday to kind of, you know, get the, the lay of the results. And I was like, uh oh, I've made a grave <laughs> error. So because I'm going to actively make time to bet them this week, they're doomed to fail. So I'm sorry in advance. This is actually my fault. It's not the universe's fault, not regression. It's 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 me. So sorry about that. And apologies in advance. But I am still going to ask you about your thoughts on this week. So let's dig in to the second half EPL match week 21. Five matches uh, spread from Saturday through Monday here across the EPL. Which traditional market bets stand out to you as being values there, Austin? So my first one I'm going to go with is in the Brentford Nottingham Forest matchup. Uh, I really, really like Brentford's money line at minus 115. 
when you look at the Premier League table, Brentford and Forest are actually right next to each other. Uh, Forest are one spot ahead of Brentford, but the underlying numbers point to Brentford being a much better team. Brentford's expected goal differential, according to FB Ref's XG model, is plus 7.3. It's actually the sixth best in the league. Forest, their negative, uh, or sorry, their XG differential is negative 6.9, the sixth worst clip. The home road splits really go Brentford's way too. Forest have lost six of their last 10 away matches, and Brentford own the ninth best home expected goal differential. On top of all of that, Brentford are getting back their star striker, Yvon Tony, who's their best player. Uh, he's a huge difference maker for the Bees. He paced the side in goals last year with 20. No other Brentford player had more than nine. His return should be a huge boost. So all in all, Brentford are the better team. They're at home. And they're welcoming back their best player. And with their current standing in the table, they're in 16th. They need results to stay out of getting into a relegation fight. So I'm really happy to take them at minus 115. And despite the fact where they are on the table, sounds like the underlying numbers have been pretty good. So Brentford minus 115 taking on Nottingham Forest. Uh, they're pretty similar in the table, as you mentioned. How much is home field worth uh, in soccer? I, I know that that's like a, a, you know, a tough question to answer on the spot, but I know what it is in the NFL. In the NFL, it's typically two points. I've got it at 1.8 personally. Does it vary a lot from one pitch to another? How much home field is worth and kind of what's the, the lay of the land there overall? Yeah, so it definitely varies some, um, just f for various reasons. Some teams are better at home than others. I think it can vary year to year. Like teams can just get on a good run of form where the crowd really gets behind them. Uh, we saw during COVID when fans were were not allowed in the stadiums that home field advantage kind of disappeared, which right. was really interesting. Um, obviously, we we're working with really small samples there, but uh, yeah, Brentford have been a team even throughout their rise through the the lower leagues to get to the Premier League. That's been excellent at home. And I'm not really sure why this number's at, just minus 115, to be honest, um, which makes me feel like I'm missing something. But sure. I think some of it is just the volatility around this being Tony's first match of the season yeah. and how much he'll play and things like that. But uh, Thomas Frank, Brentford's manager, came out and said that Tony was going to start and be the captain. So... It seems like he's going to be ready to go. And he's not coming back from injury. It's actually a suspension for betting, oddly enough. Uh, so he was able to practice and everything. And hopefully, you know, his training's up to the level where he should right. be match fit. So, yeah, it doesn't really answer your question. And I think it's a difficult question to answer and really yeah. quantify. But yeah, um, for Brentford, I would say they have been one of the better home teams in the league the last two seasons. Yeah, and the fact that Tony sounds like he'll be a full go uh, definitely is encouraging with this number. So Austin likes Brentford minus 115 as they take on Nottingham Forest. Any other traditional market bets that stand out to you this week, Austin? Yeah, so I'm really going to tempt this hot uh -oh. streak and take Sheffield United money line. It's plus 240. <laughs> they're, the, they're the worst team in the league. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really on a heater if this one hits. Uh, <laughs> so they're home Sunday morning against West Ham United. Uh, in truth, this is mostly a bet against West Ham United. They've been massively overperforming their XG numbers. Uh, they're sixth in the table on points, but 16th in expected goal differential. Away from home, they've conceded the six most, most goals. And that uh, shoddy defense should be a welcome sight for Sheffield United side that struggles to create chances. It's hard to find basically anything positive to say about Sheffield United so far this year. They've just been terrible. Um but lately, they've been a little bit better at home. On expected goals, they lost just 1.7 to 1.0 at home to Liverpool. <laughs> Hang the banner. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then their, their two home matches after that one, they allowed just a total of 1.2 XG combined to Luton Town and Brentford. So <laughs> roughly halfway through the season, they're dead last. They have just nine points through 20 matches. And Sheffield United are really at risk of kind of being cut adrift at the bottom of the table. Um, but home matches against lesser sides are matches they really need to win if they're going to get out of the bottom three. And this is one of those matches, even if West Ham are currently are sixth place. So I think the Blades have a better chance than the 24 or 29.4% implied odds of this 240 money line. So I'm willing to back them to take all three points. And I also get a little bit of comfort in knowing that if it's tied late in the match, I think Sheffield United will be selling out to try to get all three points because one point doesn't do a ton for them. 
Right. So plus 240 in the money line for Sheffield United taking on West Ham. That is on Sunday. How willing are you to react to shifts in expected goal numbers in small samples? Because for me, as as like when I'm betting baseball or when I'm betting oh, primarily baseball, I'm very willing to be reactive to shifts in small samples if it's data that I buy into. And XG data is pretty good. Sounds like you are a pretty firm believer in it. So are you willing to be hyper reactive to small sample shifts like we've seen with Sheffield United, uh, given that that number stabilizes a lot more quickly than the baseline results? Yeah, usually I'd want to have something that I could hang my hat on a little bit, whether it's like a new signing that came in. For Sheffield United, it's they fired their manager and have their, uh, they hired Chris Wilder, who actually was their manager a couple of years ago. Um, a lot of teams get that boost. Um, yeah. Sometimes they call it like a dead cat bounce if you're a really bad team. So that may be what's happening with them because they are a very bad team. I also think that even though, again, they're a very bad team, it's hard to be that bad sure. for that long. So sure. they probably were due for a little bit of positive regression. But couple that in with uh, bringing back a manager who's had success with them in the past. Uh, playing at home against a team that's not that good, I think they'll they'll see this as a chance to get three points. And really, for their sake, they need to do everything they can to to get those three points. And the, a similar effect does exist in the NFL too, like a rally around the flag effect after a firing. Uh, we had Drew Dinzik on Whale Capper a couple years ago when the Raiders fired John Gruden. He said, like, you can see that, and like it's in the data that you can see things like that. So I don't think it's a huge surprise to see potential slight uptick you know we're not going to speak too positively about Sheffield United but potentially slightly positive uptick for them yeah. so money line there for Sheffield United plus 240 keep in mind the implied odds there as Austin mentioned 29.4 percent what about player props what you see in there across the five matches this week so I'm um, uh in the Arsenal match against uh Crystal Palace on Saturday morning um I'm going to go back to the goal or assist market I love this market I uh, it's it's just a really unique market that is no other books offer. Um, so, and just gives you a lot of outs. Uh, a week ago, we took Chelsea's Cole Palmer in this market. And a big reason that I was into Palmer is that between his role on corners and his uh, gig as their first choice penalty taker, he had a lot of pass to cashing. Saka is exactly the same situation. He's their first choice penalty taker, handles a lot of corners. Arsenal are minus 245 to go over one and a half goals. So odds makers are expecting them to create chances to score goals. I think Saka has a really good chance to get in on the fun. And minus 125 is a pretty fair price, I would say. He checks just about all the boxes we could hope for. Now, as you mentioned in other podcasts, you talk about you want to wait to the lineup is out to ensure that player is in. Is that a concern with Saka or is he pretty guaranteed to be in the, well not guaranteed there's no such thing as a guarantee, but is he pretty like likely enough to be in the lineup where you're okay locking this bet in now? Yeah, I would be okay locking it in now if you don't want to get up at 6.30 tomorrow. Um, I don't. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so uh, he he's, I think, their best player. Okay. He's definitely one of their best players and typically starts. And they've had a nice little break here um, of not having too many matches. So I would assume that he'll be in the lineup and I'd feel pretty good about placing that bet today. Okay, so that is Saka minus 125 to score or assist uh, in the Arsenal versus Crystal Palace game. Sheffield United money line at plus 240 and the Brentford money line at minus 115. You really are tempting fate this week. I like that. Uh, you know, go big or go home. That is for sure. That is Austin Cass. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Austin Cass. Find his work at FanDuel Research where he is a senior editor. Austin, appreciate the time as always. Good luck to you this weekend. And we'll talk to you once again next week. Sounds good. Thank you, Jim. All righty. Thank you to Austin and thank you to JJ as well. Our previous guest, as we wrap up things for today, find JJ on Twitter at late round QB, find him at late round.com and the late round fantasy football podcast. Do not forget to subscribe to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast. We are still cooking even in as we get closer to the non NFL season. We're doing a first look at the conference championship probably Monday afternoon next week. So make sure you subscribe there as I'll uh, dig into those two matchups and outline where my numbers see value at FanDuel Sportsbook for there. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis. You can find me on threads at Jim Sonis, and you can follow FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Enjoy all the football this weekend. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 